so next up we have uh, Dr. Barbara Fair, who is going to talk about recovery. As you see here, um, Barb has, <clears throat> excuse me, is an associate professor with North Carolina State University, where she serves as landscape extension specialist for North Carolina. Her program, including research, focuses on arboricultural practices through thoughtful plant selection to proper planting and tree maintenance practices. She also teaches landscape uh, ecosystem management and environmental stress physiology. Barb has been a certified arborist since 1998. So welcome Barbara and take it away. Thank you for joining us. Great, thank you, Andy. And can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, cool. All right, then we'll get going. So as Andy said, uh, he's kind of stolen some of my thunder. So you might get out of here early because we're gonna we're gonna uh, go through some of those things that he talked about fairly quickly. Uh, maybe not. In We lost you, Barb. Oh, it now. Now I hear you. All right, that's weird. It just automatically, <laughs> like it automatically stopped recording. <laughs> Whatever. All right. I, th I thought things? you went away. <laughs> so obviously, y'all see what we're going to cover here. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more in detail about some of the planting stuff that you can do as well. So we know that cities have limited funding and that's a huge issue certainly for everything you do with your urban forestry program and if you don't have an urban forestry program you don't have particularly any dedicated funds to a lot of the stuff that you have to do so i understand that limitation having worked for a city before myself so obviously you want to target the hazards that are left remaining first and and deal with that and that may indeed get rid of your entire budget. So it does become a big struggle. If you can restore some of the significant trees that were damaged, then you can save that, that can help save your canopy, which means of course, those benefits, because we know that larger trees provide greater benefits. You think about stormwater mitigation, of course, providing shade, uh, real estate values, all that stuff kind of fits in under those much larger maturing trees. And then of course we want to plant new trees, but we want to train those trees. And I can't stress this enough to you guys that if you want to save money in the long run, when we plant trees now, we have to make sure we train them. It's great if we can get really high quality nursery stock, that doesn't always happen. So we want to make sure we get the best stock but if we have to fix some things, and you're always gonna to have to fix some things, you're always gonna to have to train trees. And a better trained tree when it's young is gonna be a better you know, middle-aged tree and it's gonna be a better older tree. You think about training yourself physically, right? How important that is. So if we need to save money, and that's the one thing I hear from a lot of people uh, in communities that they don't have the money to train young trees. And I'm telling you, you have to find that money because that will help save trees later. They're going to be much more storm resistant later on in their life. So that's my soapbox speech for today. So when we talk about hazard removal, of course, we have to look at those trees right off the bat that pose a risk. Can those trees be saved or not? So that's your first kind of recovery response once you do that. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this because Andy really kind of went over that. Uh, in pretty good detail, but you certainly have some things that you want to look for specifically with those trees. Uh, he mentioned the 50% canopy, and it is true, that's really tricky to, like everybody might see 50% differently, but if you start training yourself to look at trees and look at tree canopies for different species, like some of these large maturing trees like oaks are pretty common, right, in our landscape. So getting an idea of what does a willow oak canopy really look like so then when a storm comes through you can look at it and say yeah that's just not gonna make it we don't have enough vegetative growth behind we don't have enough foliage and so that's when we really want to think about 
how do we manage that particular plant? Uh, can we prune it? Can we save it? And of course, looking for cracks, and these are new cracks, right? Anything that hadn't been in the main trunk or big branches before, uh, we want to think about that. A leaning tree, a tree that hasn't been leaned before, maybe it has broken root systems, maybe it's been displaced by the wind. So those are plants we think about we want to improve. All right, which trees can we restore? So I kind of separated this into categories to a little bit. So the first thing is, of course, the health of the tree prior to the storm. All right, a healthy tree, it's got a lot more energy reserves. It also, um, as Andy mentioned, you know, store all trees store a lot of energy, right? And that's why restoration is even possible because that plant can, we know plants can shoot up sprouts, right? Anywhere, especially when you top them or prune them incorrectly, we see that response. So the plants have the biological ability to actually do that. So we want to kind of keep that in, in mind, all right? So unhealthy trees, what should we look for? Okay, of course, you're going to see plants like the example here is a plant that had actually been showing signs of issues for a very long time and i won't tell you where this was growing but bartlett had come out and taken a look at it bartlett had sent letters indicating we can see decay and you could see through the bottom of this tree and so of course if you don't take it out the storm is going to take it out for you. And then that's where we have issues. This tree went down in a microburst in Raleigh. And I want to say it was back uh, maybe in 2010 or 11. And so that microburst, a little bit different, right? The winds spin a little different direction and they kind of come straight down out of the sky. And so it's a, an odd kind of damage that occurs. So we know if you have plants that have disease issues, nutrient problems, if there's, as I said, root rot or decay, uh, maybe there's a thin canopy on the tree. So a plant that's not healthy, it may not fail, it may not fall over or blow over, but it may decline, especially after the storm, and especially if it has lost most of its foliage during that storm. Now, a lot of plants, for example, live oak, which I think we should be planting more of. So if you're not planting it in your community, you should definitely give a few of those a try. Uh, because as we're getting warmer temperatures in our area, those plants are going to be better suited. And you certainly, if you're along the coast, you can certainly plant that. But live oak is one of those trees that can be completely defoliated during a storm and still refoliate later. So that's really an important adaptive ability for many species of trees. Not all, of course, can do that, but uh, some can. So again, we want to be patient, as I said, if that tree seems to have defoliated, are there any sprouts left on it? Obviously, it depends on when your storm came through. And obviously, we're in hurricane season now, or sort of getting to the end of hurricane season now. Uh, so you would want to leave some of these trees that aren't posing any risk, leave those trees for later, so that later you can see, is it going to leaf out again? If a tree's lead needles turn totally brown, Oftentimes, if a tree has all of its foliage on and it's totally brown, that tree is probably dead. I hate to say it, and I get a lot of calls about that. People send me pictures of trees that have all these really, all this really nice foliage, right? But it's brown in the middle of summer when it should be green. And so the thing of that is mm, probably not a lot. So if you have any doubt, and if you're not sure, uh, you don't have maybe the arbor culture background, then certainly bring in a company to take a look at it, but leave it. If it's not a safety hazard, then leave it because it, there may be a shot. I always like to give people hope that something great could actually happen. So we know that these factors uh, affect the health of the tree. And we'll talk about that a little bit more on some of these. So the tree species. So there's kind of two categories we're talking about when we look at storm resistance, right, or storm tolerance, uh, let's say. Here's the trick, right? Not every tree is going to fulfill every need that you might have. So the first thing, of course, is looking at what is the site where these trees are growing in. Uh, when we go to plant them, of course, we'll talk more about that in a minute. But you want to try to select those trees that have shown disease resistance. And this means that they can compartmentalize that injury very well and resist the spread of uh, particularly fungal organisms into the plant. 
but you also want to pick some that are wind resistant. And what that means is they may take some damage from a storm, they may lose their foliage, but they won't necessarily blow over. So that's pretty helpful, right? If you've got a big tree, wind resistant won't blow over. And of course, there are ways that you can prune trees to help mitigate that overall. So this is just a short list of some decay resistant species that Andy had put up a table. Um, and of course, you know, maples, we have to be cautious about where we plant some maples. You all, if you've heard me speak before, I talk about red maple in particular because it's not a very tolerant urban tree. So maybe that's not the best maple to choose for a variety of reasons. Now, it seems to be a good decay resistant species, right? So you wanna kind of keep that in mind. What are all the attributes of a plant? Now, honey locust, actually, we don't plant a lot of honey locusts here, at least in the Piedmont or the coast, maybe in the mountains. Where I came from in uh, northern uh, part of the United States, uh, Pennsylvania and Ohio, we planted a lot of honey locusts. And they did very well. And you think about their canopies are pretty open and airy, so they do offer a lot of benefits. But they just don't like the heat down here. Certainly some ash, but we're not planting ash right now, of course, because of the emerald ash borer. I know a lot of people don't really dig crepe myrtle. Uh, a lot of people do like it. It has a lot of uh, benefits for many homeowners in particular because it's a smaller stature tree. It does produce really nice flowers for a very long flowering period. Uh, but it, we overplant that one certainly, of course. And it's not going to provide as many benefits uh, as like a large maturing maple as you see in this picture here. So certainly some oaks, water oak is not one of them. Water oak is one that is uh, very prone to uh, disease and decay. So we don't want to plant water oak. And that's one that can split apart very easily as well. And if you have some trees like that in your community, you want to make sure you're really keeping a good eye on them for a variety of reasons. European linden, not again one that we, we don't plant quite as commonly. And then some elm. Now I want to make a comment about elm. While they're decay resistant, we also need to make sure we do not neglect pruning those because those trees form very narrow branch angles. And as they grow, if you let them grow without doing any kind of maintenance on them, those branches will fall apart. I know you guys are probably familiar with calorie pear or Bradford pear. It's the same kind of form on some elms. And so you have to really be watching them and make sure you've got a good pruning program implemented uh, to keep those from splitting apart. I've seen it happen. I will sit here at NC State's campus. They planted a number of really beautiful elms and they did not have the chance to go back and prune them. And I watched them fall apart. They began cracking and splitting. And so they ended up taking them out, but they put new ones back in their place and those were well structured and they've been pruning them ever since. So sometimes we learn kind of the hard way. This is a catalpa. We don't always think about planting catalpa, but I'll tell you this quick story. In Ohio, we had, there was one little town and it was a very small town and it had catalpa planted as street trees everywhere. And it, it, it was a lot, but it wasn't a lot overall in the big scheme of over planting a species. But this tree is super resistant to decay. And what happens is when this tree dies, it does sort of fall apart kind of slowly. So I would see a tree that would have most of its primary structure and would lose some small branches as it died, but they are really tough plants. So, and they're kind of cool. They are kind of messy. You know, you got the kind of cigar pods uh, that grow on them. So some people may not like them, but you could try some of these as an urban tree or in some of your parks if you wanted to. Uh, this is a, a linden. Again, we do plant some of these here. Uh, sometimes I find they're not all that uh, urban tolerant, not that heat tolerant, but certainly one to, to try a few, maybe in a park setting or whatever. So the other category are these wind resistant species. And I'm curious uh, if any of you guys know what this tree is, actually the picture here, the, the bark and the leaves and the fruit give you an idea. So I'm gonna let somebody type something in the chat before I tell you uh, for sure what it is. So there's red maple again, right? Really super wind resistant and disease resistant. So maybe if you give it enough space in a park area rather than a small cutout in the sidewalk in an urban site, it will do much better for you. So kind of keep that in mind. So lots of great plants here. 
Again, you see catalpa coming up again, honey locust, some oaks, uh, right, white, red, and live oak. A uh, black locust is a native tree. I've seen a lot more people planting this as uh, in their yards, uh, something to think about. I've seen this plant with uh, fungal conks growing on it and that thing just keeps on ticking. So it is a pretty tough one. We've got a couple of elms on here as well. So I don't see anything in the chat that I can tell. Uh, I, don't, I guess I can see the chat. They um, we have a few folks that have typed in, they've chimed in, Carpinus, American Hornbeam, Right on, yes, excellent. So carpinus. Yeah, we call it American horn meme, or I call it muscle wood. As you can see, when you look at the sinewy bark, that's kind of what it is. So awesome, you guys get an A plus for today. So yeah, a great, tough little tree. It is something that you're not gonna put in very urbanized areas. Again, a little too hot, a little too tough, but in the forested area, park area, uh, in landscapes, uh, certainly one I would recommend. So tree age, as we mentioned, uh, Andy had mentioned earlier, is certainly a really important uh, thing to think about. I know, you know, I've gotten older and I gave away probably kind of my age when I was became certified arborist. Um, but <clears throat> so as we get older, things start slowing down, right? Things start hurting more. Uh, for trees, they're not growing as quickly. They are, uh, all they're trying to do is to maintain what they have. So they may not be putting on a whole lot of growth, but they still have to sustain all the other things that they do, right? Uh, producing fruit, uh, flowers, of course, producing, uh, kind of defending themselves. So producing the chemistries that are required to compartmentalize uh, any kind of damage or disease. So this is a great example on the right, this big tree. What would you do? What could you do? Well, certainly you're gonna have to investigate this little area right here. You can see with my arrow, hopefully, that you have two main stems here. So how many main leaders did you have on this tree? Right, you had three, and there should only be one on an oak, right? Elm is different, right? You're gonna have more than one leader. You're not gonna have a central leader, but that's why it's so important to prune that tree to make sure you're controlling uh, its growth and kind of maybe doing some subordination pruning to make that tree a little bit tougher to slow the growth of those branches down. So this is why this tree, uh, this branch failed is because it was a co-dominant leader. So we have to really be, and the problem is, is if you don't fix it when they're young, this is what happens when they get older, that, that pressure continues. And I wanna make a case to you guys here and think about this. Think about where we're putting trees compared to where they grow naturally. So in the forest, trees grow very tall and they have very narrow canopies. And that also means that the diameter of the branches is much smaller in relationship to the trunk. And we call that aspect ratio. And it should be about, that branch should be about half the diameter of the trunk of the tree at least. And you can see in this case, they're kind of close, but remember we're taking them from that forest situation or putting them in more open areas. So we're gonna get bigger canopies, which is awesome. But then it also means that we need to do more pruning and more management of those trees because we don't want those branches to get too big, all right? So the recovery part is so deeply tied to the prep part, to being ready that you can't separate them, right? Of course, that's why they have the three R's. But so keeping that in mind, so how long it may take for that plant to recover. Of course, younger people recover faster than older people when you're out like doing a marathon or whatever. Um, and certainly trees are in it for the marathon, right? So younger trees are gonna be much more readily able to move on. The extent of damage, of course, you can see here, this is a close up of that last tree I showed you. Uh, maybe you could, you could keep this tree for a while, but it, it, there is some significant loss there. Was that 50% of the canopy? No, but remember you have to consider all the other factors in what's happening to the tree itself. Same thing with this very large tree. This was at the state troopers uh, like headquarters. I don't know if that's the right thing, but where their training center is, they have dormitories there. And it's actually just a mile from my house uh, on Garner Road and in, in Garner, Raleigh, sort of somewhere in between the two. It's very close right there. So it lost this big stem in a storm. And this is actually a chinkapin oak, very cool oak. But you can see that there were issues already, right? We had a large crack down the trunk of that tree. 
and we had many co-dominant leaders. And so you can see that uh, bark inclusion area there. So how much damage? And so they did take this tree out. And in this case, they may have taken, maybe it could have stayed, maybe not. Again, I didn't get a chance to, to really look at it and see it and make a, a real evaluation, but sometimes it may be more cost effective to remove a tree and plant a new one than to try to plant it, uh, that, than to try to prune it, I'm sorry. So keeping that in mind, because of regular inspections while you're pruning, it's going to take time. And of course, time is an investment uh, in the plant, but it's also uh, money in uh, the bank as well, essentially, or money out of the bank, so to speak. So this is a picture from Andy, this one on the left here, and this is a tree that had some damage. Uh, you could clean up some of these little cuts, and we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, in a second, but certainly you can see where there's some growth happening. Can we leave those trees and see how they grow? I'd say absolutely. We should definitely give that a try. Uh, this is I love that these guys call themselves tree surgeons. I haven't heard that in a very long time. But on a canopy like this, you have lost more than 50%. How valuable is it? Can you get up there and make clean cuts? That's a great question. Uh, so again, each tree being analyzed individually, and obviously this is not right when you're doing that rapid response, right? This is when you know that the risks have been mitigated, you've taken care of that, and now you're going back and taking a longer look and seeing what potential is there to save some of these trees. So how do we restore a canopy? How do we clean out that canopy? I believe this is also a picture from Andy and Ice Storm up north. We do have them here occasionally, and I recall a few years ago we had a serious one. I remember driving out west uh, in the western part of the state, how much damage was actually done to many of our trees from ice, right? And these are forest trees. You're not going to do anything about those. Uh, so how well do they grow back? And certainly they grow back better than we often think, right? Again, think about a topping cut. When somebody makes a topping cut, not that that's okay uh, in most cases, but what happens? It elicits a, a growth response from the tree. So you have to look at branches like this and see this, of course, is a forest tree and maybe not something that you would have to deal with, but it gives you an example of what kind of, how could you clean this canopy? Of course, in this case, the one on the right, you would want to make probably a collar cut. It does look like it's cut back into that, uh, into the trunk a little bit. It's broken back into the trunk a little bit. So uh, you're gonna make a cut and it's still probably not gonna close over completely because you wanna cut it uh, because of how much it was damaged. But it's still worth making that cut and uh, allowing that tree to respond. So what you wanna do here when you're first kind of doing restoration pruning, right? You've decided that tree can stay, it's an awesome plant. We know we can do some recovery and it's worth the financial investment. Uh, so you wanna make sure you've gotten rid of the hazards. And now we're gonna go back in and make some nice proper cuts, some clean cuts, because you're gonna get better growth out of there. I recently heard somebody talking about how people will chop up the end of a cut uh, and leave that. And, and it's meant to be sort of as if it broke off and it's natural, but I really recommend that you make a clean cut. You're gonna get a much better response. So think about shaping it, making it look pretty later, right? We just wanna get it to, back to growing. And then you have to think about how much time it's going to take. So I just wanted to address the three kinds of cuts. I say two here because I'd rather you focus on these two options if you can. And there's a ton of information out there on pruning. I actually have a video on our extension YouTube channel, but if you just Google my name or go to the Hort website, Hort, uh, Hort Department at NC State, you can put my name in and it'll take you to my page where I have a bunch of information on planting trees as well as training young trees. So something that you definitely wanna check out if you don't feel 100% confident in, in your pruning skills or your staff's pruning skills. And I'm also here to come and help you uh, teach. I do workshops on pruning and stuff for, uh, all across the state. So feel free to contact me. So two cuts. The one on the left, of course, is the removal cut, and that's where we're taking an entire branch off. And this just shows you how you might proceed with that. This is what we call the three cut method. That bottom cut, of course, is to make sure we don't strip the bark down but that removes it at that collar. And if you look, you can see about a 45 degree angle. Here's our collar, here's our branch bark ridge, 
and we're making that nice cut. And so that is a removal cut. And so you should, in most cases, get good wound closure there. However, as we know, the bigger the wound, the slower that closure will be, and sometimes it may not close over at all. So again, that's the response of an older tree versus a much younger tree. How do, how do they respond uh, when there's an injury? So younger trees tend to have, if they're healthy, of course, tend to have more energy than older trees. Or you can do a reduction cut. Now a reduction cut is not taken back to a collar. As you can see here, you're taking typically, you're typically taking off the terminal. And we sometimes call this subordination pruning, which means you're gonna slow the growth of this branch down. And that's often a really good thing because it can put those resources in a different direction, right? So you typically take them back to another lateral and that lateral bud should be about one third to one half the diameter of what you take off so that it can continue with food producing capabilities. So this is something you would probably use quite a bit with storm damaged trees where you are going to reduce that branch taking it back to a lateral that isn't damaged. And you may have to do that to a lot of branches on a storm damaged tree. So I'm showing you an example here on, on the left, upper left corner, that is a removal cut taken back to the collar. Here on the bottom right is a removal cut, uh, I'm sorry, a reduction cut. So you're cutting it back to where you have a lateral. Why this one? Well, it was a pretty good one and it was the first good, healthy, strong one. It's a great size. You could have taken it back to this other one. And so keep in mind, you could also do directional pruning here if you need to. If you're trying to get plants kind of to grow away from the building, you could take it back to a, a lateral branch that's moving away from the building. So there's a lot of cool ways that you can prune trees. So this is essentially a reduction cut. We've taken the, the main branch, the main leader of this particular branch off. So the third one, that's why I said this is, it's, we're hopefully doing those two, but sometimes you may have to make a heading cut. And on larger maturing trees and large stems, we also call that a topping cut. It is not the ideal cut, but you can see what we're doing here. In this case, you'll see the stem, you're cutting it off, uh, leaving a stub, you're not taking it back to a lateral, uh, and so you'll get sprouting coming out from that wound. The problem with this, as you can see in this upper picture, is you get decay in here, right? Because you're pruning it at a place that the plant can't really respond. It's not gonna close that wound over as if it was at a, a, a branch collar. And so with that, you're gonna get a lot of sprouting, but you can actually recover trees that have been topped this way as well. And I'll show you a picture of that in just a second. So the reason we don't like it again is because you're not really getting very good wound closure. On this other one down here at the bottom, you can see they've taken it back very close to a little lateral bud. And that bud is not really all that big. So you probably could get some decay into this little stem here. So kind of keeping that in mind, it's a little tricky, uh, but you can do it because it does encourage sprout growth. And if it's a tree worth that, you can do that, but then keeping in mind that that's going to be part of, of restoration for the long term. Remember, it is not the same as topping. While it may be a topping cut you're forced to make, that's not how you're going to leave it. And I'll show you in a second a great picture of that. So this is kind of what you're looking for, right? We're trying to train it so we've got a lot of sprouts formed when we first make the cut. Then we begin thinning out those sprouts, right? These are small. And I'm gonna show you one that's actually quite big. And then we end up with just a few more. So we're eventually looking for one or maybe two branches to be our main structure for the canopy of that tree once we've done that. So you're kind of looking for the most vigorous growing ones, the ones that are growing hopefully kind of in the direction that you want them to, primarily up, hopefully, right? Uh, you're trying to get them spaced a few inches apart, right? So some you're going to reduce, you're going to shorten them a little bit to slow them down, others you might remove. And so this is something that you have to invest in because you're going to have to come back. As with restoration pruning of any kind, you're going to have to invest some money, uh, invest some time and come back and build that structure over the long term. So this is a tree done by Bartlett. If you ever go down to Bartlett Tree Laboratories, they had trees that had been topped. And so they went back in and they actually began a recovery program. And you can see, I don't know if you can see the red circle, but right in there 
are, you can see where branches have been chopped and they're beginning to develop a new structure from those. This is the same here. This was an older one, an older topping cut. And they've left this little branch right here and this bigger main stem coming out of that original injury. So the whole tree had been treated like that. So you can get long-term recovery from a plant. It has to be a tree, of course, that's healthy otherwise, right? When you decide to make this restoration, these kind of restoration prunes. So when we think about your urban forest in your community, however big it is, maybe it's only half a dozen trees, who cares? It's, so it's your place, it's your important forest. And so what makes one? A diversity of species is really important. Right. So and it's going to become much more important because of, of climate change where we're getting uh, hotter conditions. It's going to be more important to pick the right species and prepare the site well and plant it correctly. So we want young and old trees. So that means we want obviously to continue to plant trees as trees are lost. But we want to try to have uh, kind of in forestry, we call them uneven aged stands where we have uh, younger maturing trees that only maybe they're mature at like 20, 25 years, and those trees that mature at 100 years or more in age. So, excuse me, we're looking for that kind of diversity as well. We wanna plant trees in groups when we can. Remember going back to that idea of building forests. So if you have spaces in your parks, instead of planting one tree, plant a group of trees, and they're much easier to maintain, right? Especially if you have turf grass there, uh, to mow around bigger areas where you have a lot of trees kind of grouped together, they help each other. And that, you know, kind of creating that little forest uh, in your park. And so that's a, a just something to think about. We don't really do that. And we've never really talked a whole lot about that in the past, but I'm seeing a lot more people talking about creating these little mini forests in open spaces, park spaces, wherever you might have room. So of course we have to have those young, well-trained trees and properly pruned older trees. So plant new trees, or we're not gonna get anything like this, right, if we don't plant new trees. And so this is uh, actually a linden, this is actually in Pennsylvania, so it is a pretty good one for that particular site. Plant material quality, right? This was at a Walmart in Garner that this tree was planted, and there were quite a few of them. Don't even get me started on the staking, but you can see we have multiple leaders here. I could fix this, but I wouldn't buy this. So we want to make sure we're purchasing the best high quality material. There are certainly the ANSI standards to follow. And actually, I sit on the North Carolina License the North Carolina Landscape Contractors Licensing Board. And we've been working on developing specifications for North Carolina, sort of like Florida has these Florida fancy standards we're kind of going to create our own they're not going to be as fancy uh, but they're going to be very useful to tell us what kind of trees are we looking to buy for different situations is this a street tree is this a parking lot tree is this a park tree and also we're developing those for shrubs so we want to make sure this is actually a maple so we want one single main stem or leader in a tree like this as you can see this is a willow oak that's what it should look like right and so you'll notice, and this is why I talk about young tree training, there's some things that certainly could be fixed on this once you get it into the site. If you plant a tree, if you happen to get a tree that has a co-dominant leader, when you're planted it, trim that off right then because the chances of you coming back and doing it. And you can teach shade tree committee members to do that. And I understood from the survey that there's a lot of communities that have those people that are volunteering for them teach them how to plant trees and how to do some young tree training because that can certainly save you money and i know many communities in ohio had people that did that and it worked quite well so that's where i'm happy to come down and teach your shade tree committee members how to prune trees properly so in a tree like this you see at the top here we want to make sure that there is a terminal that really is dominant over the other ones and so sometimes you may have to cut these back if there's crossing branches in here, you want to cut them back. If there's very narrow branch angles, you will probably want to remove those branches as well. So the quality of the plant material is super important, right? We buy lots of different planting stock. We typically are buying ball and burlap for many of our applications in city planting, citywide plantings. Uh, and so you want to make sure that we know where those first main order roots are. Those are these right here. 
We want them at the top of the root ball. If they aren't, I can, I've can i got in my video to explain to you how you plant them. It's not the end of the world. You can still install them at the correct depth, just understanding where those are. And then of course we have our container grown plants. And a lot of folks I've seen don't want to plant container uh, grown plants because of this, because they see these circling roots on the outside of the root ball and they also see girdling, trunk girdling roots on the inside. Sometimes you can't even see how bad they are. Sometimes you'll find them on ball and burlap trees as well. Just keep that in mind. So I can tell you, I'm not gonna go into it here, but I, the video that I have shows you, there's very, a few different sections of the video. So none of them are really longer than a couple of minutes. And I show you how to manage this. We shave off the outside and we slice down through the, uh, through the root ball itself to get kind of close, not quite up to the trunk, but to get any of those trunk burling roots there. So planting these trees correctly is really important, particularly avoiding girdling roots, because if you have a tree that has girdling roots, it's the tree's gonna grow, it's gonna get large, and then all of a sudden, maybe the tree falls over, or during a storm it falls over, because you've essentially girdled it and it snaps off right where that girdle is. So be very thoughtful about where you place trees. Of course, that is a really important part of the success of those plants. This is topping on the right, and this is unnecessary topping because they planted it under a utility line, which we shouldn't have planted it there in the first place. So kind of keeping that in mind. The utility company is going to do their thing, and most of the time they do a very good job with pruning these days. But they certainly would prefer that we didn't plant large maturing trees under the utility lines. And I know the North Carolina Urban Forest Council has a great brochure if you want to give that to your homeowners or whatever, uh, talking about utilities and trees. So they don't always have to be in conflict if we do things well and correctly. So again, making space to plant trees in groups. If you have space, let them grow, right? The more rooting space you have, the better growth that plant is actually going to get. So that's just an example. This is downtown Washington, DC, and these are magnolias. So you can have plenty of space to plant these in. What species to plant? That again is really dependent on a number of things, and I'm not gonna go into this in any great detail. I just wanna point out, this is information from after Sandy, I believe. And these are New England communities, and the city foresters there kind of kept this list of plants that, do, that they found actually performed really well after the storm. And this has to do with flooding in this case. So we know we have plenty of flooding down here in North Carolina, right? So when you see that, you can see some trees that actually did really well, right? Some of the maples. Acer compestry is hedge maple. We don't see that planted very often. Raleigh has some, and they're, they're actually on Garner Road, and they're awesome. So Celtus occidentalis, another tree we don't see very often. This is hackberry. A lot of people don't like it because it only has yellow fall color, but it's still pretty. Uh, it's a bottomland species and it's pretty tough. Gymnocladus is Kentucky coffee tree. I beg you to try that tree in park spaces. It's an awesome tree. So even Lagerstromia, which is crepe myrtle, was on there. So we have some magnolias. Uh, we have some other plants that we might not have heard of or might not plant, but I'm certainly willing to share this. And I know these are going to be recorded, so you can certainly look up the botanical names of these plants. Quercus virginiana, of course, is live oak. And Quercus five color is one you might not have heard of, it's swamp white oak. And I'm encouraging people to try that here a little bit. What plants they found did not work. And this, some of these were surprising to me. Uh, Japanese maple, Leyland cypress, just don't plant that at all. There's too many fungal diseases that cause problems for that plant. But tulip tree, not, it is really an upland tree. So that makes a little bit of sense to me that it would not like to be flooded for very long. Most pine trees don't like to be flooded either. So there are a few plants that we should stay away from, at least in the sense of if you're worried about flooding. And right, so this complicates it all, right? We're trying to get trees that are disease resistant and wind resistant and flooding resistant, right? As well as doing all the other things we want them to do. So it's not an easy thing, but certainly thinking about your site and what you want the tree to do for you is super important. Now, I'll just touch on this a little bit because you can save some trees, actually, that have blown over in a storm. And I've actually done this. However, it is not very effective for trees that are greater than four inches in diameter. And I think this picture is a great example. This is from the University of Florida. And it's not staked very well. Now, if it was staked the way I'm going to show you in a second, it might actually stay over. 
But when you're getting into larger trees, they are probably not going to stay up. So the next storm, they'll be blown over again, especially if you don't stake them properly. So you want to make sure that you, you're going to put them in. You're going to do it as quickly as possible if you want to. If you can't do it right away, you need to get out there and put some wet mulch on it or burlap or something to keep them, the roots from drying out. This is the staking method that I recommend for any tree that you're planting instead of uh, the typical thing that you see uh, going down to the ground with wires and such. So this actually holds the root ball down, which is the part we want to hold down. We want the top of the tree to be able to blow in the wind and build some taper so that it can actually move well in heavy winds. That's the whole key. So I'm gonna show you this in a little bit better detail in just a second. So this is what a planting hole course should look like, a pretty good example. So you may have to re-excavate if you're putting a tree back up, you're gonna possibly have to dig behind the roots to get it set back into its site pretty well, okay? So you wanna make sure you're getting it well situated when you stand it up again. And this is just an example of how to plant any tree. Uh, this is a, a ball and burlap example here. So don't cover the trunk. Uh, if you're gonna use, use fill soil, you can add a little organic matter if you want, but it's not uh, a big deal. And then make sure you stake it. You do wanna think about irrigation because that, that tree that's blown over is probably gonna need to be irrigated a little bit more than other established trees. You're gonna almost treat it as if it is a newly planted tree. So again, a little bit of maintenance will be required in this situation. So I, I thought I had a great picture in there, but I must not have. Uh, so you can certainly do that staking method for any kind of tree that you're planting that I showed you. Uh, and let's go back and just kind of wrap it up. So obviously we're going to remove anything that poses a risk right off the bat. We talked about risk assessment already. Then we're going to see what trees can be restored and we want to be patient with how we take care of those trees and understand that it's going to take a long time. Older trees are going to take even longer than younger trees. So we wanna bear in mind that it's gonna take time, okay? So you also wanna replace those trees that are lost because we want to have a continual urban forest, right? That's super important, especially it helps with long-term storm mitigation, having trees can help protect properties. So that's a really important thing to consider. So I'm happy to take any questions that you all might have. Here's my contact information. You can contact me at bfair at ncsu.edu.